Ready to go? I've got a question for you. Listen to the question very carefully. I'll write out some of the important things on the board. You ready? Jane is 16 years old, OK? And she's got a brother, and she's four times older than her brother. She's four times older than her brother, OK? My question to you is, how old will Jane be when she is twice as old as her brother? So spend about a minute, try and work it out. If you want me to repeat the question, stick your hand up and I'll repeat it again. Jane is 16 years old. She has a brother. And she is four times older than her brother. How old will Jane be? Do you want to answer? I want you to write down the answer. Don't yell it out. How old will Jane be when she is twice as old as her brother? Hang on. Spend about a minute. When you get the answer, just write it down. Just, just, you know, write the number down and circle it. Some of you might still be doing a little bit of math or jotting down or, or whatever. But I'm not that fussed about the answer, to be honest. But if, and, I, and you don't need to show your hands, but here's what you did when I posed the question. You either said, I don't know. It's impossible, I don't know. Right? Or you thought about it for a little bit and you thought, four times older, twice as old, ah, it's impossible. So you either did, I don't know, or, now it's impossible. Or you said, hmm, I'll try and figure out the answer. Jot, 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 right, 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 think, think, think. Oh, it's too hard. I don't know. It's, it's beyond me. Or, D, you came up with the correct answer. Or you come up with an answer that you thought was correct. OK? Now, if you were in the A category, I don't know, wonder what I'm doing this weekend. Yes, Friday, right? <laughs> then what I want you to do is that little voice inside your head that says, I don't know, right? You, outside of this class, I'll leave that up to you. But for this class, I want you to mentally take a baseball bat and club that voice to death. Don't ever let that voice tell you, I don't know. Ever, 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 for whatever task you're given, do not, OK? And that's quite liberating, really, because then that resistance barrier is that resistance barrier is gone. Yourself telling you you can't do it is gone, right? That should bring you to step B. Um, that's impossible. I don't know. I wonder what I'm doing this weekend. Um, so the point is, I want you to club that I don't know voice to death. What I really want you to do is try and figure out the answer. Sometimes the answers are beyond you beyond your understanding, beyond your realm of experience, and that's OK. Because what do you do if it's beyond you, if you really can't do it? No, you figure out how to solve the problem. You don't say, I don't know, and leave it. You don't say it's beyond me. You figure it out. That means you find a resource. You ask someone. You ask me. You ask your neighbor. You look in a book. But you find a resource to figure it out. Because let me tell you, most of these problems are not beyond you if you want to figure out the answers. Right? They're really not. They're absolutely within your grasp. So I want you to get to the point where you're D. I can figure it out. And I'm not going to stop until I've figured it out. 
So that voice that says, I don't know, it happens all the time. Listen to it, and when you hear it, beat it to death, right? And then at some point, it will stop saying, I don't know. Okay, anybody know what the correct answer is? Yes, 24. Now, some of you thought it was impossible, right? Yeah, four times older, twice as old, that doesn't jive. The correct answer is 24, because in eight years, how many years' time will she be 24? In eight years' time, she'll be 24, right? Her brother, she's four times older than her brother. Her brother's four right now. How old will her brother be in eight years? 12. 24 and 12, she's twice as old as her brother, all right? There's something called proportional reasoning, which is a skill you started to develop about 12 or 14 years old. And it was very well investigated by, um, um, I think it was a Swiss psychologist called Piaget. Um, and these proportional reasoning skills are very important to you. You may have developed them very well at 13 or 14 or whatever, 12. But if not, there's something you can learn now. Okay? And so, obviously, I'm not going to specifically teach you reasoning skills, but it's something that will be important in this class. Okay? So, that was the take-home message from this. I don't know, absolutely not. Beat it to death. Okay? Do not tell yourself, I don't know, or I can't do it. All right? Now, if it's turning, I don't know, wood into gold, you might want to say it's impossible. Okay? Okay. And the next question I've got for you, anybody know, just, just raise your hand if you know what the code word is. Just raise your hand if you know what the code word is. All right, you should all know what the code word is if you did as I asked last time. Now you're all feeling a bit nervous, aren't you? What did I do? Please read the syllabus carefully. Whole syllabus. I know it's not the most riveting of reading, right? But please read the syllabus. Not now, but before Wednesday. And I'm going to ask you again what the code word is. I can't be any more subtle than that, can I, really? OK. All right, should we get on with biology then? Yeah. Um, before we carry on, I just want to give you, again, another um, Cell phones, all right? Please keep cell phones not only out of sight, but turned off. Out of sight, turned off. Please do not look at your cell phone during class time, OK? All right, is this where we left off then? Yes. So life is DNA-based. The continuity of life is based on heritable inf information in the form of DNA. So all life is DNA-based, OK? All of the instructions to make you, to make every chemical in your body, well, not every chemical, but, but close enough, either directly or indirectly, all of those instructions are encoded in your DNA, your genetic material. It's almost like a book that has all of the instructions to make all your chemicals, directly or indirectly. And once we put those chemicals together into molecules, molecules into organelles, we get emergent properties, right? Organelles into cells, yeah? Cells into tissues into and organs into organisms, individuals. You get emergent properties at every level, and at some point, life is an emergent property. So, genes are made of DNA. Genes are very simply seg sequences or segments of DNA that have within them instructions to make proteins. So, genes are just, think of them as a sort of functional lengths of DNA. We'll talk lots more about genes and DNA in a later week. But there's what the DNA molecule looks like, at least a model of it. Obviously, the actual molecules don't look like this. But this is what a model of DNA looks like. And it looks fairly complicated there, but it's really not. So these letters here, A, C, T, A, T, A, C, C, G, that's really the language of DNA. That's the code. 
those letters. Have you seen the movie Gattaca? Or do you remember the movie Gattaca? It is a good movie. I liked it. It's got Jude Law in it. Great British actor, right? Yeah. So, did you ever wonder what Gattaca actually meant? Anybody wonder what Gattaca meant? Well, sorry? It is. Yeah, you're absolutely right. G-A-T-A-C-A. -A -A. It's a little sequence of DNA, a little code. There's the letters. There's our G-A-T-G-A-T-A-C-A. Okay? It's just some of the letters in DNA. Because it's a sort of biotech movie, right? Sort of futuristic DNA movie. So if you ever forget the nucleotide bases in DNA, just remember the movie Gattaca, and that's an instant reminder. Right? Yeah. OK. Your DNA molecule, again, we'll talk lots more about it. You don't even have to write this down now if you don't want to. But each DNA molecule is composed of two strands. It's a double-stranded molecule okay, that then is sort of twisted into this what's known as a double helix. It's almost like you take a ladder, and the, um, the uprights or the supports of the ladder are like the two strands, and then you twist it. Okay? It's kind of the structure of the DNA molecule. And the building blocks of the DNA molecule are these bases, these A's, T's, C's, and G's. And just like the order of the letters in a word give that word its meaning, the order or the sequence of these bases in the DNA give the DNA its meaning. Okay? Again, we'll talk lots more about this in a later week. So genomes, you've probably heard of genomes, right? Human Genome Project, genomes. What's a genome? Think of the genome as, yeah, pretty much, kind of a library. It's your entire library of genetic instructions. Your genome is like all of your DNA, all of the DNA that you have. Now, I'm mostly talking about the DNA that resides in your nucleus, right? Because there's DNA that can be in other parts of the cell. Now, the human genome. is three billion chemical letters long. Those A's, T's, C's, and G's, it's three billion of them in your genome. And although there are some exceptions to this, every single cell in your body has an identical copy of your entire genome. So your retinal cells have an entire copy of your genome. The cells in hair follicles, entire copy of the genome. The cells in your skin, entire copy of the genome. Cells in your lever, liver, entire copy of the genome. Every single cell has an entire copy of your genome. There are a few exceptions. Okay. So the, exceptions, the exceptions are red blood cells when they're functional, at functional maturity. Your red blood cells don't have a nucleus. So they don't carry an entire copy of your genome. But if you're a bird, well, for whatever weird reason, birds do have a nucleus in their red blood cells. When your red blood cells are first made, they do have a nucleus. And then they just lose it before they become functional. The reason for that, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. And then your, um, your gametes, sperm and eggs, don't have a full copy of your genome. Sperm and eggs have half the amount of DNA. Okay? So they're, they're two, two exceptions. I'm sure there are others. All right, so the rough draft, we were, let me backtrack a little bit. Once we discovered that DNA was genetic material and that it was a sequence, what's the obvious question that begs? Is everyone the same? Maybe a question before that. DNA is this molecule, it's got a sequence. What's the burning question you want to ask? Yeah, what is that sequence? What is it? How do we sequence it? And so there was a guy called Frederick Sanger who won a Nobel Prize for it. He figured out the technique to sequence DNA. And now we've got machines that can sequence DNA extremely rapidly. All right? Now, so of course we wanted to know what's the sequence of the human genome. To answer questions like, 
Does everybody have exactly the same sequence? Well, you don't. Very, very similar. But in 2001, sort of rough draft of the human genome was published, the first sequence, the first rough draft. That's remarkable, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Now we can do it an awful lot faster. We've got these sequences that have recently come onto the market, and boy, they're very quick. So why do we want to sequence your DNA? Is there any direct application of knowing the sequence of your genome? There, there isn't a, I wouldn't say there's a direct application, but once we can get the sequence, then we can start to answer questions. All right? So we can answer questions like, well, if we know the sequence, then maybe we can understand the nature of genetic diseases. Maybe we can, like crime scene stuff, maybe then we can compare sequences and, you know, if someone leaves their DNA at a crime scene and you can compare it with a suspect and they're the same, if we understand the nature of DNA, is that same sequence, does it mean same DNA? You know, was it the person, the suspect, did they leave their DNA there? Just because they've got the same sequence in a small part of their genome, does that mean that the whole genome is the same and they're the same person? So we have to understand it to answer many, 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 many questions. Genetic disease is obviously a real hot topic. And just the basics about DNA. How does it work? How does it function? OK. So again, I'm going to leave DNA alone now. We'll spend about a week or two weeks on it later. But it's a major theme in biology, DNA biology. So let's have a look at another sort of major theme in biology. And I'll call this number four. And it's this structure-function relationship. So if you can sort of put this, give yourself a mental shelf to sort of put things on, and put this on your mental shelf, right? Something that you can recall quickly. This whole structure-function relationship. And what I mean by structure-function relationship is that form fits function. Let me elaborate on that. The form or the shape or the structure of something fits its function. Okay? That's true of something like a hammer. Don't you think the structure of this is well suited to its function? It's got a really hard head, right? You don't want to be banging in an hour with a stick of butter, do you? No? It's got a really hard head. And it's got a long handle. So you can sort of wield the weight of that head to do a lot of the work for you with that long handle. And then it's got, you know, these little claws just there. Well, they're really strong and well suited to pulling out nails. So the shape and structure of this is very well suited to its function. Think about a bucket. That's well suited to its function of carrying water, for example. So the structure or shape of something often fits its function. Maybe we can improve upon the shape or the structure. But that's true of many of your structures. They're very well suited to its function. So. That's true at the molecular level, and it's also true at the um, sort of macroscopic level. All right? Think about the, the wing of a bird. That's well suited to flight, the structure of the wing of a bird, well suited to flight. But then the structure of the protein that makes up your hair, keratin, is very well suited to the functions of keratin. It's very, very strong. Okay. So form fits function. When you look at something, something biological, whether it's a molecule or a structure, you can very often infer its function. Or you can say, because of its structure, it's well suited to its function. You can think about its function. So understanding its structure gives clues to its function. That's true at the molecular level, right up through the sort of macroscopic level. So here are some examples. Again, the wing of a bird, its function is well, its structure is well suited to its function. It makes it well suited to its function. Here's the bones from birds. If you have a look inside them, they're mostly air. They've got this sort of matrix, and that means they're very, very light. Again, their structure is well suited to their function. Birds have to be light in order to fly well. Now, different birds will have different shaped wings, different structures to their wings. It makes them very well suited to their function. Think of a hummingbird, which is capable of very rapid wing movement, 
very fast movements and it can, it, can, it can hover in place. And that's partly due to the structure of its wings. This bird is a gull of some kind and many of these seabirds migrate over very long distances. So the structure of their wing is very well suited to long migratory flights. Okay. Any idea what this might be? I don't expect you to know, but any idea? Unless you've got the book right in front of you. What is it? Not a bad guess. kind of looks fungus-like. <coughs> it's an epifluorescence micro, uh, micrograph. So they add some dye that fluoresces, usually under ultraviolet light, of, what is it? Nerve. nerve cells. Nerve cells have to communicate. And so they have all of these projections that enable them to communicate with many other nerve cells. Okay? So again, the structure is well suited to their function. They've got to communicate with many other cells. So they should have connections with many other cells. And then this. I wouldn't expect you to have a clue what this is. But it's a, scan, it's, um, a transmission electron micrograph, and we'll talk about those later, of an organelle that is present in all eukaryotic cells. So all the cells in your body have this organelle, and its name is a mitochondria. So mitochondria. And we'll talk more about mitochondria later in the semester. But it's an organelle within your cells which is responsible for, um, it has to do with your energy reactions. All right, something called cellular respiration. But look at its structure. These black lines are membrane. And can you see this extreme folding inside, these little projections? I'll draw it for you. There's this membrane outside, and the membrane inside is very highly folded like this. Any time, almost without exception, in biological systems that you see all of this folding, almost without exception, it's to increase the surface area. That folding increases the surface area. And very often, we need to increase the surface area to increase the area for certain chemical reactions so we can fit more in a smaller space. Okay? So anytime you see folding, increase the surface area. Increase the surface area, usually, so there's more space for reactions or more space for the movement of substances across the membrane. There's another thing here. We've got sort of space one space 2 and space 3. So we've got this double membrane, 1, 2. So we've got three different compartments, really. And so again, the structure of the mitochondria is well suited to its function. It's got this high, lots and lots of folding, and these three different compartments. These three compartments separate certain chemical reactions. Okay? So anytime you see this compartmentalization, that's usually to spatially separate chemical reactions. All right. It's why you keep baking soda in one jar and vinegar in another, right? Give me different compartments because you don't want them reacting together. Okay. All right. So that's structure function relationship. So understanding the structure gives clues to its function. But do you think you can go the other way around? Do you think if you know the function of something, you could infer a structure? Yeah? Yeah, maybe you could. Imagine I gave you a chemical, right? Just got some kind of chemical and injected it into you, and I knew what it did to <coughs> you. I knew what its function was. Do you think for that chemical, I could infer a, a structure to that chemical? Is there any way I could do that? Well, I'll, I'll give you an example, but it's just something to ponder for a moment. All right. Okay, and understanding the function does give clues to its structure. So here's sort of another concept or theme in biology, and it's that biological systems or biological organisms or systems, we're open systems. Organisms are open systems. And here's what I mean by an open system. It means that... 
you take in things from the outside, from outside of your body, or an organism takes things in from the outside, maybe it changes them or processes them, and then it releases things back to the outside, chemicals. Takes certain substances in, changes and processes them very often, and then releases them back to the outside. So there's an exchange between the organism and its external environment. There's a, an exchange. That's what I mean by an open system. So a closed system, if this box is representative of an organism, a closed system would mean nothing leaves, nothing enters. Living organisms are not like that. Stuff leaves, stuff enters. Just think about you, right? You breathe, you exchange gases with the atmosphere, so you inhale, you take in air, and you exhale. The air that you exhale is a little different to the air that you've inhaled. You take in food, right? You change the food. And most of that food that you take in, most of the molecules, actually do end up leaving your body in one form or another. Either you pee or poo them out, right? or you, they leave your body in the air that you exhale, believe it or not. Okay. So, open system. Did you get all that? If you didn't get that and you find yourself looking up there and writing it down, use that as a little cue, as a sort of, okay, I've got to take notes, not just on what's on the PowerPoint, but what he says as well. And again, Taking notes on what I say is, is important because it makes you put it in your own words rather than my words on the PowerPoints, okay? All right. So think about, is that the minerals? Yeah, minerals. Plants, through their roots, take up minerals. When plants die and they decompose, microorganisms break them down and they can release those minerals back into the soil. So think about energy also. A closed system would not exchange energy with its surroundings. A closed system would eventually sort of use up all of its energy and run flat. But living organisms have this energy exchange going with their environment. If you're a plant, you're going to take in sunlight. That's a form of energy that you're going to take in. You're going to use that sunlight. And then maybe you're going to release some other things, some other chemicals or some other things. All right? Maybe you'll release other form of energy. You take in energy, right? The food you eat, some of it goes to sort of your biomass, some of it you extract the energy from. And then you release chemicals that are maybe lower in energy. And this graphic here sort of shows a flow in a system. There you've got sunlight. Plants can take up that sunlight convert that sunlight energy into chemical energy, then consumers, like these giraffes that are feeding on the leaves, well, they can take in that chemical energy. Some of that chemical energy is lost as heat. Actually, a lot of it's lost as heat. A lot of it's used to do work. So the energy is just kind of shuffled around from one form to another. So this sixth theme, then, in biology is about regulation. All of the reactions in your body, all of the things in your body, are very, very, very tightly regulated. Okay? Very tightly regulated. All of the chemical reactions in your cells, very tightly regulated. And there's a group of chemicals, you might as well write their name down now, called enzymes. So there's a kind of a group of chemicals, or actually proteins, a specific kind of protein called enzymes, which a sort of regulate all of your chemical reactions. The Correct. They're just sort of the chemical reaction regulators. <laughs> Feedback. Um, they're involved with that. Yeah, they are involved with that. Now, enzymes do more 
then regulate the chemical reactions, all right? But let's just leave it at there. I'm going to give you a chemical reaction right now, one that you'll just need to sort of remember and understand verbatim, so I might just as well give it to you early. C6H12O6. Anybody know what that substance is? You may or may not. I don't know. If you've had biology before, you might know it. It's glucose. Okay, glucose. Now, glucose, you know, you, glucose looks a lot like table sugar, right? A lot like sucrose or the fructose that we saw in lab if you were in the Wednesdays group. All right, it's kind of a, a white solid that dissolves in water. But you can link glucose together, many glucose molecules together, and you can make a lot of other substances, like plant cell walls are primarily made of a substance called cellulose, which is itself made of glucose. So think of wood, chunk of wood, which is largely plant cell walls, lots and lots of cellulose in that wood. The cellulose itself is made of glucose. So you can almost look at a chunk of wood as just kind of um, um, a lot of glucose, right? It doesn't look like the white solid, but that's really what the chunk of wood is. Yeah, lots of glucose. It's more than just that. Yeah, how come it's not sweet? Well, here's the deal. When you join those glucose molecules together, right, especially to make cellulose, then it becomes sort of, um, chemically, it has different properties. It doesn't dissolve in water, and it doesn't taste sweet. Thank goodness wood doesn't dissolve in water, right? Or every time it rains, your houses would just, you know, plop. Yeah? So, we've got glucose then, we can burn or combine glucose with oxygen. All right, O2. And when we undergo that chemical reaction, we simply break up the molecules over here and rearrange them into different substances over here. We actually make Anybody know what CO2 is? Carbon dioxide. And good old H2O, water. All we've done is broken these up, rearranged them into these. Now, I'm going to balance this chemical equation. Don't worry about balancing chemical equations right now. We'll talk about that next week. But you should write it down anyway. Just that everything on this side, all of the atoms on this side, we need to account for on this side. Okay? So, glucose plus oxygen gets converted to... Do I need to write down carbon dioxide and water here? No, but you can. All right. So, I can take glucose. I can. I can burn it. Anybody ever burn sugar? Yeah? All right. So, it does, and it... When you burn sugar, some of it gets converted into carbon dioxide and water. When you burn wood, essentially what you're doing is you're burning glucose, and what you're giving off is carbon dioxide and water, largely, and all that white powder that's left behind, it all, all, many of those sort of minerals that the plant uptook and that is, is part of the wood. All right, so the minerals don't, don't get burned. Some of them do, I guess. Oh, some of it, yeah. You know when you burn, make a fire and it pops and crackles? Oftentimes that's water still in the wood. The water expands because of the heat, and so it, it sort of explodes out. The minerals that are left over, is that why after like a forest fire, the grass grows so fast because it's so cool. It's one reason. It's a huge release of minerals, yeah. Is that why you start cleaning up all the parts? Yeah. Else? Yeah. It's the minerals that are not volatilized or combined with oxygen. Yeah. So we can burn wood, right? burn glucose, make carbon dioxide and water. In your mitochondria, your body takes glucose molecules in your mitochondria, combines them with oxygen, and makes carbon dioxide and water. The carbon dioxide, of course, leaves your body in your breath. So does much of the water in your breath, or you pee it or sweat it out. Okay. So we've got the same reaction, combining glucose with oxygen. It goes on within your cells. And it goes on in a campfire. But the burning of wood or set glucose 
in a campfire is an uncontrolled reaction, completely uncontrolled. It just goes as fast as it needs to go. But in your mitochondria, thank goodness, it's very tightly controlled. Right? Or you'd go up in a ball of flames, maybe. It's very tightly controlled, this chemical reaction. Why do you burn wood at a campfire? What's one of the reasons? <coughs> keep, keep you warm, right? Maybe some light. I know it's a nice ambiance, but gives off heat. So do you think burning glucose in your mitochondria also gives off heat? It does. That's why you um, are warm-blooded. You burn so much of this that you generate an awful lot of heat, and that maintains your body temperature. It's one reason why you have to eat a lot. Okay, so the point I'm making then, is here's a chemical reaction. This is an unregulated one in your body, very tightly regulated. Very tightly regulated. And the reason why you have this chemical reaction in your body is so that you can extract the energy from glucose and use it to drive other reactions and processes in your body. All right? And I'll leave it there. We'll talk more about that later again. The name of this reaction, if you want to write it down, is it's the summary equation for cellular respiration. The summary equation for cellular respiration. And I've put the word respiration down there, look. Just as an aside, see all the light and heat being given off from that campfire. Where did that ultimately come from? Where did that energy ultimately come from? Sorry? The energy. Where did the energy ultimately come from? Sorry? Yeah, but the light and heat being given off, that's energy being given off, that's stored as chemical energy in the glucose. How did that chemical energy, how did that energy get there in the first place? Keep going back. Sorry? The sun, yeah. Plants take in sunlight. They use that sunlight energy to make chemical energy, like glucose. So next time you make a campfire and you look at that campfire, what you're really looking at is the light and heat of the sun, right? It's kind of nice to think about it that way, isn't it? And of course, you just killed a tree. All right, so, and there's your mitochondria. So the reaction goes on here, the reaction goes on here. Essentially the same reaction. Here it's very tightly controlled, here it's uncontrolled. So your body regulates, very tight regulation of all your chemical reactions. You also regulate many things about your internal environment. So you regulate all the reactions that go on in your cells, you also regulate your internal environment. And we call that regulation of your internal environment homeostasis. Now in 181, we're not going to talk very much about homeostasis. You will in anatomy and physiology, though. So this animal is an oryx. Anybody know another word for an oryx? Yeah. In fact, you should say chemsbok. Because chemsbok is an Afrikaans word. And the Afrikaans language say G's like, uh, it's kind of like, like a bit like you've got a throat disease. <laughs> like that. Chemsbok. So it's an oryx or a gemsbok. And these animals are quite common in the southern part of Africa. Um, they're present in some very hot, dry parts of Africa. These are the sand dunes in a place called Sussusfle in Namibia. Sorry? In the States? Oh, I, I, they're, yeah, I, I don't think they were ever native there, though. No, they were brought in, yeah. So in a place like the hot sand dunes, it can get very hot, water shortages. The oryx is able to regulate its temperature and blood concentration 
in that environment. Now, it can do it to a certain degree. Obviously, if you deprive it of water for a long time or it gets too hot, it's outside the limits that it can regulate. But it's very good at regulating body temperature and water content. You're very good at regulating your body temperature when it's very hot out. What do you do primarily to regulate your body temperature when it's really hot out? You sweat, right. How much sweat do you think you can lose in an hour? There's a sweat index, believe it or not. National Geographic had an article once, and they calculated your sweat index. Some people have a very high, some people very low. Very hot, dry day in Arizona, how much water can your body lose in an hour? About two liters. A bit more than that. You can lose even over three liters in an hour. Yeah? Could you drink three quarters, three quarters of a gallon of water in an hour? That would be hard to do. You can, but it's hard to do. So imagine you're outside for four hours. Got to drink three gallons. It's tough to do. OK, so this next theme then in biology is this unity and diversity. And what I mean by that is that there are factors or things that unify all living organisms. But within that unity, there are things that unify organisms. There's also a lot of diversity. What would be a unifying, um, a unifying principle or something that unifies that all living organisms have? Cells and DNA. Right. They, that's part of life's unity. Right. But then within that unity, things that unify life, common characteristics that organisms have, of course, there's huge diversity. Like we've got different species. How many different species on planet Earth do you think there are? Ooh, yeah, you're good. So there are about one and a half million species described. And it depends who you talk to as to what number you actually get. Some folks say we've got about a million and a half organisms that have been formally described by science. But it might be as high as two million have been formally described by science. These are species that we found and formally described and that will have a scientific name. Have we found all species on, on planet Earth? No, we haven't. We're still discovering new species. Right? Occasionally, there'll be a new mammal discovered or a new amphibian or something. That's pretty remarkable that you think, you know, as, as, as well discovered as planet Earth is, that there should be some mammals or amphibians that we've never, never found or, or discovered uh, or named, given a scientific name in science. So, oh, before I go on to that, some folks have said there are upwards of how many species on Earth? Some folks have said, you know, I know we've described about 2 million, but there are probably about 40 million are the upper estimates of the number of species on Earth. About 40 million. Some folks have said there may be as many as 40 million species on Earth. But let's think about that 1.5 million described species. About a third of a million of those are plants. Got about a third of a million described species of plants. About 50,000 vertebrates. What do we mean by vertebrates? Yeah, we equate that with a backbone. Strictly speaking, it's not a direct equivalency. But we'll say that it is. So things like fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. When we talk about vertebrates, you can think about those five groups. Strictly speaking, it's not. It's more than that. But. All right. Almost one million insects. <coughs> Look at that. They are the champions, right? Two-thirds of our described species are insects. And within the insects, what is the most speciose group of insects? Anybody know? Sorry? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So there was a very famous evolutionary biologist. He may not be famous to you, but he's famous to me. He's, he, he's um, J.B.S. Haldane was his name. I don't even know what the J.B.S. stands for, really. But Haldane was his last name. And a clergyman once asked him, he said, after a lifetime of studying God's creations, you know, what can you say about that? And you know what his answer was? His inordinate fondness for beetles. Because right? beetles are the most speciose group of insects. Lots and lots of beetles. All right, so... I'll give you this number 
as some of the estimates, because I think it's the one that your textbooks use, is they've said maybe there are between 5 and 30 million species. Some folks, some of the more recent literature has said, you know, it might be upwards of 40 million. How can we project that? How can we speculate that there might be 30 or 40 million species? How do we run those numbers? How do we come up with those numbers? Any ideas? Here's one way of doing it. What you can do, the tropics have an awful lot of biological diversity. What they've done is they've gone into the tropics, certain tropical countries, and they've put sheets underneath trees, and they've gone up into the trees with foggers. And these foggers pump out insecticide. So they fog the tree with insecticides, and the insects die, and they all fall down to the ground, right? And so you collect them all up, and as long as your um, insect taxonomy is pretty good, you can then go ahead and identify all the insects. Well, let's just say that, of those insects you collect, only 10% of them have been formally identified. That means 90% of them haven't. They're new species. So then we can use that as a way to estimate how many species there might be. Does that make sense? But of course, that's just for the tropics, right? But our diversity is decreasing as species go extinct. And right now, we're in an extremely rapid period of species extinctions. Species are going extinct. Um, probably more rapidly now than any other short point in time in our past. Even when the dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago, when a very large proportion of the Earth's species went extinct, I think it was just over 90% of the species on Earth went extinct when the dinosaurs went down. We're in a period of more rapid species extinctions now. And the cause of it is people people, people's activities. So let's have a look at some of this diversity then. What could this organism be? Was it? Yeah, I heard it. Yeah, these are bacteria. What bacterial cells look like. You're not going to see this under our microscopes. This is an electron micrograph. So bacteria, what, what's this? Tree. What sort of like big group would you put it in? What was it? Go on even bigger. Did someone say plant? You mean plant? Right? So we've got bacteria, right? We've got plants. Bless you. Oh, what group would this one be? It's a mammal. Let's go a bigger group. It's an animal, right? The animals, those monkeys that live in, in Japan. Animal. Ooh, anyone know what this one is? It is a shell of what organism? It's actually a nautilus. I think it's a nautilus. And what group is a nautilus in? It's a little marine organism. Sorry? Uh uh. Looks a bit like. Um, a lobster. It's not a lobster. Go a bigger group. Go bigger. What group is it in? Go bigger than crustacean. It's not a crustacean. It's not an insect. Go bigger. Go broader. It's an animal. Animals are a pretty broad group, right? Animal contains the crustaceans, the insects, right? The mollusks, like the octopuses. So this nautilus is in the animal group. Are you animals? Yeah. Are um, ants animals? They are animals. Are snakes animals? Yeah. Sorry? Not quite close. Mm, not quite. What group would we place this in? Fungus, the fungus group, right? And then last, but by no means least, those of you in Wednesday's lab, shh, you probably saw some of these, some of you in Wednesday's lab, something very similar to this. Do you remember what group I said it was? Like, very broad group. It begins with P. Protozoa. 
protest, yeah. So what I've done there then is I've given you five very broad groups. And no matter what organism you pick on the planet, you can put it into one of these five broad groups. Now, do you remember we talked about two cell types, prokaryotes and eukaryotes? Which of these are prokaryotes and which of them are eukaryotes? Do you remember? Yeah, bacteria are prokaryotes. Everything else are eukaryotes. Right, good. So we've got about one and a half or two million described species. How on earth do we keep track of them? How do we catalog them? This subject of taxonomy is a way that we sort of catalog and identify and keep organisms in some sort of organized system. So taxonomy then is a subdiscipline in biology where we describe, organize, or classify living organisms. And it's funny, it's a tendency of humans, of the human brain, to want to categorize things. When you see a car, you think, oh, that's a nice car. Oh, that's an ugly car. Right? You instantly categorize it, don't you? Or you can say, you know, that's an SUV, that's a, a truck, that's a sedan. Right? You categorize them. You same, we do the same with living organisms. So we've got this hierarchy, this hierarchy of groups that we use to classify living organisms, to, or keep them organized. And this graphic's in your book. I'm not sure it's the best graphic, but it's in your book. So at this level here, this is like our most inclusive level. Oh, have they changed the graphic? In, oh, they've, oh, they've changed their graphic. I should change my, my graphic to them. What page is it on the 8th edition? On page 12, they've given you a different graphic. I'm not quite sure that one's any better. but. <clears throat> so here we've got a group then that's very inclusive. So maybe this is the animal kingdom. This represents all of the animal kingdom. And within the animal kingdom, we have subgroups. Okay, and this represents one of those subgroups. And within that subgroup, well, there are other smaller subgroups. And then within that subgroup, other smaller subgroups, smaller subgroups, and so on. So I want to tell you what those names are. What is this biggest, most inclusive group down here? The I'll talk about domains in a minute, because there's two, two common ways of doing it. This is the, the, the one I'll give you in this class. There are two ways of doing it, and I'll share that with you in a moment. But our most inclusive, biggest group, I'm going to call our kingdom. Okay? So any living organism, then, you can place in one of those five kingdoms that I gave you. It can be a bacteria, or a fungus, or a protist, or an animal, or a plant. kingdom. And the name of the next category that's nested within kingdoms, we call the phylum. I'll put these bigger. I'll give them to you, oh. I'll give them to you bigger there. There's our kingdom. The next group is the phylum. And within a phylum, there are classes And within the class level, there are orders. Within the order level, there are families. Within the family level, there are genera. And then within the genera, there are species. Do you feel comfortable with this sort of hierarchy, though, and what, what, it, what it means? I'd like you to know the names of each of these taxonomic groups, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. If you've taken a biology class in the past, did you have a, a little mnemonic you used to remember I these? I remember it for my life, what was 
All right, there's loads of them. But here's one that I'll give you. It's, um, oh, and it doesn't quite sync. I think this is a difference between a PC and a Mac. King Phil came over for good spaghetti. King Phil came over for good spaghetti. All right, if you remember that, you can remember the King Kingdom, Phil Phylum, came class, over order, four family, good genus, spaghetti species. There are loads of other ones. Oh. <clears throat> so the example we've got up here is the example of the wolf. We can do the full taxonomy of the wolf. Wolf is in the animal kingdom. We place it in the animal kingdom because of characteristics that the wolf possesses. You're an animal if you're an individual made of many cells and you have no cell walls. It's basically an animal. It's quite basic, isn't it? And then within the animal kingdom, there are lots of phyla. The wolf happens to be in the phylum chordata. And this is where it gets sort of a bit tricky with vertebrates and, and so on, but I won't tell you what defines a chordate, but you can think of a chordate as being synonymous with an organism that has a backbone or vertebral column. It's not strictly speaking true, but it's okay. Then within that phylum chordata, it's in the class mammalia. And then within the class mammalia, it's in the order carnivora. And then within the order carnivora, it's in the family canidae. And then within the family Canidae, it's in the genus Canis. And within the genus Canis, it's the species Lupus. I want you to know the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Am I going to want you to know Chordate, Mammalia, Carnivora, Canidae, Canis? No not specifically for the wolf, but um, it, it might be nice if you could be familiar maybe with some family names or some order names. All right, And again, we'll talk about that in a later class a little bit. Okay? Here's what I definitely want you to know, though. Scientific names, a little bit about scientific names. Scientific names are not English. They're not the English language. What language are they? Latin. They are Latin. Now, any word that you write that is not in the English language needs to be underlined or italicized to indicate that it's not the English language. That's why scientific names are underlined or written in italics, because they are Latin. Why do we use Latin? Why do we use Latin? To name organisms? A lot of them are based off of Latin. I'll tell you why. Latin um, is a language no longer spoken, so it's a language that no longer changes. Right? So if we name it Canis lupus, as long as we keep an understanding of Latin, it will be Canis lupus from here to the cows come home. Right? The English language, words change. Their meaning changes. So do many other languages. But this is a language which is very well understood, very well spoken still, but it doesn't change, at least not, not, not very much. And so usually when you discover a new species, you'll write a paragraph, you'll describe it in Latin and English. All right, so we've underlined it then. Why do we always capitalize the first letter of the genus? What words get capitalized, the first letter? Proper nouns, right? Because in a scientific name, the genus is a proper noun. It's kind of the Latin equivalent of Bob or Bill or Fred. Right? Not completely, not, you know, being a little bit sarcastic, but... Okay, it's a proper noun. That's why we capitalize that first letter. So this is a proper noun. The second part, the species epithet, second part of the scientific name, is actually an adjective. 
All right, it's an adjective, a describing word. And I don't know what lupus means. I just don't know. All right, so we've got Canis lupus. That's the wolf. There are actually several subspecies of wolves in North America. We've got one here in Arizona called Canis lupus bailei. We would add a bailei part to this, and that's because it's a subspecies. All right, don't worry about subspecies, but I just thought I'd tell you that because we've got one of them in Arizona, which is kind of nice, Canis lupus bailei, the Mexican gray wolf. Where are we time-wise? I forgot to bring my watch. 9.05, so what, we've got another 40 minutes? 10? <laughs> All right. Just checking. So I'm a little bit ahead of my time here, but um, so I'll go over the assignments, then we'll come back to lecture stuff since it's got 10 minutes. Um, please read chapter 1, chapter 2, page 2. And I would also read chapter 3. In terms of your readings, try to stay just ahead of the lecture. Don't fall behind the lecture. You can read further ahead if you want, but don't fall behind, OK, in terms of your readings. And what you'll notice is, in each chapter, I don't cover the full chapter in lecture. It would be impossible. It would be insanity to try and cover everything in every chapter, OK? So I pick out what I feel are the most important things that you need to know. There will be, I might, I might go into some things from the textbook that I don't lecture about that I consider to be very important. But I'm not going to ask little nitty gritty bits. Okay? And I'll usually tell you, read this part of the chapter. Okay? So you never sneak into questions from within the book? No, not so much. You know, I might do a couple. And it's really, for those of you that are really reading the book and getting a lot out of it, you can benefit from that. Chapter review, I would do them. The chapter reviews are really good, and the chapter tests are excellent, OK? The review questions. They're a really good way to review for your in-class exams. Okay. All right, sorry. I, again, I didn't anticipate another 20 minutes, 10 minutes, whatever of lecture. So on the subject of taxonomy, then, I've got the taxonomy of some other organisms. Here's a human being. We're in the kingdom Animalia. We're chordates, we're mammals. Order primates, family hominidae, genus homo, species sapien. We're homo sapiens. All right? Let's take, um, I guess chimpanzees kind of cool. Animals, chordates, mammals, primates. Oh, family level, we differ. How'd you say that word? If you can see it, pongidae. It's kind of a cool name, isn't it? Cool family name. Genus is Pan, species Troglodytes. Look at that. That's kind of a cool name. Yeah. And there's one for the house cat, lion, and house fly. My favorite scientific name is for a bird called a hoopy. And its scientific name is Eupupu epops. Eupupu epops. That's a great scientific name. So, how do you name a new species then? Well, I got involved in my research days before coming here. With, um, I was working with fungi, and I was working with a group of fungi that live within plant tissues, healthy plant tissues. All the plants you see out there that have healthy leaves, there are actually fungi that live within those healthy leaves but don't cause any disease symptoms. And they were a relatively newly investigated group of organisms, at least 10, 20 years ago they were. And so I was doing some work on a, on a kind of oak tree out at Oak Flat which is near Superior, east of here. And we cultured the fungi from the leaves, and we found it was a new species, a species that had never been described or discovered by man before. And so fungi under the electron microscope look something like this. They have all these filaments. You can think about the fuzzy stuff that grows on food in your refrigerator. It's been there too long. Yeah, that fuzzy stuff is fungus. And when you look at it under the microscope, electron microscope, it looks a bit like this. But it doesn't have these filaments. So when we had this fungus, you know, my fungal taxonomy is not great. But I looked at it, looked at the books, looked at what had already been described, and it didn't look like anything that had already been described before. So then you find an expert, an expert in that group of fungus or that group of an organism, and you send your specimen off to that expert. And they'll look at it, and they'll decide whether it's a 
species that's ever been described before. And I sent this particular fungus to a woman called Margaret Barr, who lives in Vancouver, Canada. And she's an expert with the particular type of fungus that I found. Okay? She said, no, it's never been described before. She said, do you want to describe it as a new species? I said, sure, let's do it. And so she looked at the organism, all of its physical characteristics, and she wrote a Latin description for it. I did measurements of lots of different things about the fungus, how big its spores were, the shape of its spores, and then we took photographs of it. And so the genus, how do you say this genus name? Go on, have a go. If that voice was telling you, I don't know, club it, right? Give it a go. Close, Ophionomania. 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 That's how you say the genus, all right? So this genus had already been described before, <coughs> but this species was not. And so she said, let's call it Cryptica. Okay? She decided what the species epithet was, and it was because the structures that produced the spores were cryptic. Remember I said this is an adjective? Yeah? Because they differed in size a lot, but the spores were the same. And so then we wrote up a description for it, gave all of the information that somebody else could use to identify the fungus if they ever found it. There's the scientific name, and when you write down a scientific name, you should state the people that discovered and named the organism after it. So that's me, Wilson, and that's her bar. So it's Ophionomani Cryptic Wilson and Bar. So you don't, this doesn't mean you have an, an organism named after you, but it means you're the naming authorities for it. Um, you know Gary Larson, yeah, cartoonist, right? Someone who worked on um, lice. Yeah, their specialist, speciality was lice. Lice on, on your bodies. Well, they found a new species of, of, of a louse, and they wanted to name it after Gary Larson. And I don't know what genus they put it in, but they gave it the species epithet Larsoni, or Larsonii. I can't remember which one of the two. But so it's nice, he's got a louse named after him. <laughs> what an honor, eh? Yeah. No, I think it was, um, it was uh, endearing, the, why they did it. <clears throat> Sorry? That's right, yeah. So, classification then. Can somebody tell me when we hit time to finish? Because I forgot to wear my watch. There's no clock in here. If someone could just give me two minutes. Have you already got your book away? No. <laughs> oh, good. That's brilliant. That's what I like to hear. So, this is one way that we can classify life on Earth using this five kingdom system of classification. I'll give you a couple of alternatives. And again, people argue right now, biologists are in dispute to some degree about how many kingdoms there are and what system of classification we should use. But I'll present two of them. One is this five kingdom system of classification. I so said there are five kingdoms. Kingdom Monera, which equals the bacteria, and they're all prokaryotes. Kingdom plantae, which are the plants, animalia, the animals, fungi, the fungi, protists, protists. Plants, animals, fungi, and protists are all eukaryotes. So this is one system of classifying organisms at that sort of very broad level, the kingdom level.